There's no sort of abstract, perfect thing that you're aiming at and so on. There's a sort of, did you get away with it? I.e., nobody threw something. Nobody threw anything, so you got away with it. If they actually start sort of being enthusiastic, then, or continue being enthusiastic and want you to do more and so on, that can be, ver that can be very pleasantly uh, uplifting. It's always different. It's, you know, there's no two nights are the same, and better or worse, I don't really like to say. I mean, I f maybe feel better or worse after it, but that's not always to do with what got played. But, I mean, just actually playing, uh, even if I feel really off colour, you know, I'm, on, I'm at the end of a, a week's worth of hangovers, and the first 15 minutes you feel like death warmed up. Oh, that's a really loud amplifier, I hate it. You know, but after about 20 minutes you get used to that. You know, that's so just the music itself will actually make some difference. But if you get good feedback as well, like people are paying attention and sort of letting you know that they like it and so on, then yeah, it sort of, you know, it grows, it gets sort of more interesting. Yeah. I try not to, do, to work like that. I mean, I sort of cut back a little bit in recent years, but that playing, you know, sort of six, seven nights a week and so on, does lead to that peculiar state of affairs known as the cumulative hangover. Just as an aside, this is a po the cover says that Paul Theroux, who I quite like, and mostly for his not his railway journey stuff, there's one outside I want. But you open it and it's actually a Stephen King novel. I've never seen that happen. Wrong cover, different book. <laughs> okay, so it would be 400 for cash and 600 on credit. Okay, thank you. So you can then decide that. The Stones, on the other hand, were doing it. Uh, I don't want me no slave. I so singing much higher and so on. I can't do it like that. It's just not how it is. So there was a real conceptual gulf. You know, they were taking this stuff, converting it, and relaying it to a public that wanted high energy rock and roll type stuff. Do you need a bag for it? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Much And that gave me a reading list. In effect, and who's this guy? You know, Bo Diddley, Jimmy Reed, Chuck Berry. I, I noticed Chuck Berry, he had a couple of hits. Uh, but there were all these other names that just meant nothing to me Muddy Waters and so on and so forth. And so I went out and searched the record racks and began to realise there's all this other stuff out there that they were coming from. So it wasn't really by until the mid 70s that I started going back to the stuff that I'd noticed a lot of from other bands. Uh, almost too many to list, Quicksilver spring to mind, some of the Dead's repertoire, even Steely Dan, we had a jazzy thing to them, Little Feet. Um, oh, too many to list. I started to realize basically that all the stuff that I really liked that had lasted since I'd been interested in music was blues based. 
and so on and so on until now. That's basically what I do.
um, I never really liked acoustics. I had a couple to start with, and I didn't get on very well with them at all. I basically, I very nearly gave up. Um, I have a small range, and I've had many in my time, but for the last oh, 15 years or so, Fender Telecaster Thin Line has been my uh, weapon of choice. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Where this one is different from the standard model is that it has uh, humbucker pickups, which uh, tend to a fuller, slightly more bassy sound. And the fact that it has an F hole, there's a hollow chamber that runs here. It was never a very popular model. It was only in production for a year or two after that. But this just seems to have all the tonal possibilities of the Telecaster plus the sound are a lot of the characteristics that make Gibson semis so attractive to me. So that it's like having two guitars in one in this case, and that's really, really useful, I think. So I don't like messing around changing guitars on stage all the time. I want one is with the range of available tones and so on should be all that's really necessary. This specific one, as compared to the, uh, the other, um, has a tendency towards uncontrollable screaming feedback. And when you get above a certain level of volume and you're too close to the amp. And I actually quite like that. You know, there's a sort of, gives it a certain wildness that you have to sort of, it's like you have to hit the thing to actually restrain it. You know, it's like wielding whips and wild animals and stuff like, being an animal trainer in a circus, that kind of thing sometimes. It sort of wants to sort of take on a life of its own and start screaming at you. So I, I, I like that. It's a little less disciplined in some ways. Basically, what I use is the same as I used when I was about 16. Um, the Crybaby Wawa and a distortion pedal of some kind. That is, both of these things have changed, but I actually had one of the first Crybabies. And the distortion unit I made wasn't, I used wasn't made in those days. Now it's an, it's an Ibanez tube screamer. I'm a bit cruel about those. When I see someone with, with um, well, actually, three or four seems to be the minimum these days. And, of course, people have these boards with every conceivable unit they could ever imagine wanting on them. And to me, these people have become tap dancers. The sound you make is, given all, all other things being more or, you know, more or less equal, it's much more to do with how you hit it. The actual, you know, the acoustic properties of the instrument and how it responds to the way you handle it, how your fingers work, how hard you hit it, and how gently you hit it, because there's a big range possible. Oh, it had to be a couple of thousand. And it had an annual, or every, every year or two I got it, I had a fret polish, and every sort of two or three years, re new frets, because I, I wear them out, you can see the sort of, the marks on the, uh, other ones, you have to do that from time to time. But of course, I started, I scooped out these bits by simple uh, use of the bending strings. As I say, that moved from, well, from there to there. <laughs> within, well, I say it took me about 10 years of hard playing here. I was expected to be the big deal academic at school because I was like, you know, top of everything, highest IQ, etc., etc. My heart did not lie in that, in that direction, so I left uh, quite early on. We did a huge array of 
bit of unskilled jobs of many kinds, some of which were quite interesting. I was a computer operator in, the, uh, in Edinburgh University for a while when I was about 18. <laughs> I've cleaned toilets, I've done sort of dishwashing, I did. One of the worst jobs I ever had was to be a... Uh, you know how they have in winter, they have grit squads, people on the backs of lorries throwing grit down onto the road when it's snowing and so on and so forth. I was unfortunate enough to join the spring detachment of those guys who are not throwing down the grit, they're picking it up. And uh, I discovered that everyone on the same squad as I was on um, was basically just out of prison. Restaurant business. I did everything in restaurants apart from cook. We were squatting at the time in central London. We had a mansion. And around the corner was a restaurant, which uh, it transpired was uh, always on the need for staff. So basically that whole squat ended up staffing that restaurant. So I suppose it's this time round. It's since the early 90s. So in the end, the day job just had to go. I got bored with it anyway. It sort of started becoming too corporate. But it's always been off and on. You know, you sort of, you, know, you play for as long as you can survive. And if it's not actually happening, okay, you get another day job. And then six weeks later, you drop that. You start another band, you do that for a few weeks, and then you get another day job, and, and so on, you know. bass and drums uh, and that works very well because we have good chemistry we've done maybe 2,000 concerts together something like that in about 10 years and uh, we just sort of get on I mean we don't socialize much out of uh, working hours because we spend quite a lot of time together in working hours but we don't actually have any big arguments either the biggest version that I have is a quintet, which is me, 
bass, drums, keyboard, and Betty singing, Betty S on vocals. And we worked together quite a lot in London in the period before we left. She's now in Vienna, uh, working in all kinds of projects, teaching in, a, sort of in an institute of music, whatever it's called, and um, occasionally coming up here to do something. We had a really interesting gig with her in uh, November, and it worked very, very well. It went down absolute bomb. Let me see. One of the most fun one. One of the most fun ones was Johnny Hooker Jr. Um, he was actually kind enough to thank us for doing for supporting him. Absolute gentleman. And I, I thought it was somewhere. You know, I mean, we had quite a good session. The Bekarovka fluid and all that. He was a good guy. Sugar Blue, I, I count as a friend. He's turned up at uh, weekly show at Glenn's and sort of going, "Hey, well done," and so on. Counts double from him because I've seen him. I've seen him play. I, I, I. Um, we did support for uh, the late great Bo Diddley as well. That was good fun. And Bob Margolin as well. He's the author of uh, Brown Liquor, which is one of my favourite tunes in my current repertoire. He got me up on stage with him. I got on with another couple of local guitar players and so on. I remember playing support to uh, for Johnny Winter for a few years back. There were four, the four bands on, including Winter. We were the one before him, and I was flabbergasted by the fact that we got two encores like that show because I didn't have anything ready for encore. I hadn't even thought about it. I just presumed that okay, we finished right, we go now. The big man gets up. That's how it works. But suddenly, there's like three thousand people going, "Hey, more!" <laughs> you know. Twice. <laughs> I met Hubert Sumlin as well. I got half an hour of, with him on Le Chumper at Blues Alive Festival a couple of years back. That was probably one of the most satisfying moments I've had. Thank you. 
when you're actually experiencing it as it's meant to be experienced, it's party music. This happened, but fuck it, we're still alive and we're still partying. You know, that to me is much more important. <laughs> Oh, my God.